it's like a sunrise in the morning. So I need to borrow some sunscreen right now. Thank you. <laughs> This is Tom Coyne, a best-selling author known for chronicling the most insane golf stories that people would only ever dream of. He's walked the circumference of Ireland, he played 111 courses in Scotland in just 57 days, and now he's on to his latest book, A Course Called America. This is a small part of his story. The story I'm trying to tell in A Course Called America is the search for the great American golf course. Which means I sort of have to figure out two things. I have to figure out uh, what great in a golf course is and also what American means, uh, you know, in, in 2019. And I suppose it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people in a lot of different places. And that's why I want to go to all 50 states, to places I haven't visited, to get people's perspectives on the game, on their lives, how they interconnect. And then, you know, once I've done that, I think I'll have a sense, a, a much better sense for my own country, and we'll be able to answer that question as to, to what course to me best represents golf in America. They wanted really these hard. courses that would like potentially be tour venue where they felt like they were playing a it tour was all venue. Championship. Yeah, like look we played this. Like courses were good if they were hard. Which kind of says a lot about different generations that like the next generation is like we just want fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like cool. It's a game. Alright Mike's gotta go from here. What's up guys? I'm attempting a flop shot and over there. Golfer, so. <laughs> Who knows what's gonna happen. Hey! Who says they're not a good golfer? Sometimes condo courses are good for stuff like that. They just turned the music on for us as soon as we got to the tee. <laughs> hey, I love Every it. Saturday morning, yeah. Yeah. when we have Gilmore themes on. It would be better if he was in his tidy what he's smoking a cigarette on his deck. <laughs> The first tee is this sort of space of universal accord and, and those are the spaces I want to share with a lot of different people from a lot of different places. You know, it's funny, when I look back on, on why I do these adventures and what's driving me, you know, there's definitely obsession at the heart of it, at the core of it, no doubt about it. Um, and I think golf lends itself very nicely to people with obsessive personalities. You know, it, it's a game obviously that you can't master, that you can always get better at. And whether that be on the golf course, or whether that be reading about it, or whether that be shopping or, or anything, there's there's always sort of some way to be thinking about the game. So for people who like to get lost in their endeavors, and I'm, I'm one of those people, golf is fantastic. I got it. No problem. Club selection. Nine iron. New shaft after this round after he breaks it across the tree. Sam, <laughs> you're out. Green side bunker. Who are your favorite golf authors not named Tom Coyne? Favorite golf authors not named Tom Coyne. Whoa, that's a <laughs> tough one. James Dodson is a really wonderful writer and, and a really good dude. Michael Bamberger is, you know, to, uh, to the Lynx land is definitely a book I read and I was like, I, I want to write golf books for sure. George Pepper, in terms of his history and research uh, and just being a great guy, um, he's someone whose career I look at and think like, yeah, he, he did it right. You know, I was up in Newport with him. He's like two clubs in Newport and then he's down, I think, in Charleston for the rest of the year. And, yeah, he did it right. But you know, he's written so many history books on the game that, and I use them. They've been really helpful on this trip. In fact, I'll probably just plagiarize the hell out of most of the way it's done. <laughs> oh my God, you're recording that. We've got a 147. Beautiful day for an ace. Just get there. <laughs> oh, that's gonna go too. Go! Red, yeah. white, and blue flag too. Oh. Not, not very patriotic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got all that. Gotcha. <laughs> Dude, you're almost pin high. Go. Go, baby, go. Oh, oh it's gotta go. Uh -oh. Oh. oh! Oh! Wow! Fat 
What'd everything. you think? Wet or dry? Oh, I thought it was wet. <laughs> I did too. Go. Oh. oh no. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh. He gets to do it again! Oh, oh no. Gotta go for the noodle after that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Definitely noodle. That's good. Go in. I just, I, I'm working on a few things. So I'm practicing today. <laughs> so if I controlled golf in America, wow, how would I change it? There are a lot of things I'd change about golf in America and they probably grow out of my experience in Ireland and Scotland. One, they play faster and we just need to play faster. Three and a half hours is plenty of time for a round of golf. You know, it's a sport, keep moving, hit your shot, play it like an athlete, not like you're a mechanical engineer. I'd also do some small things like, you know, allow more trolleys to get people walking more. I'd allow dogs on a golf course, because you see that in Scotland, and I think that's great, and I think that's a, a way that we'll get more people playing it. I'd probably put the emphasis uh, in, in terms of new golf courses, think more about short courses and nine holers. There's a great nine hole culture abroad, and we have some here as well, but you know, nine holers tend to be more accessible. They tend to be places where people can learn the game, and they also tend to be community centers. You know, whether because of their size, they can kind of sort of fit within a town. You don't need a ton of acreage to maintain, and they and thus they're, they're, they're more affordable as well. So our obsession with you know 7,000 yard, 18 hole courses is something that I would rather see go away. I think you're seeing that in places like Sweetens Cove and Winter Park, where people are just finding the joy of golf in shorter courses that take less time to play. And I'd also think about golf abroad. If you have a credit card and a handicap, you can pretty much play anywhere you want. So our sort of gated country club model, even though I belong to, to a country club, you know, I don't see why there can't also be opportunities for visitor play at private courses. It'd be good for the courses to, to, to make some money off greens fees, but you know, why two days a week for an hour don't you have open tea time slots? And limit it so that someone can't come every week so that, you know, they're playing your course that way versus joining as a member. But it would just be cool to give people a chance to sample other courses. I mean, we seem to celebrate courses by how hard they are to get on. You know, it must be a great course because no one gets to play it. And that's definitely not the attitude that you find, you know, in Scotland. And in Ireland, the course is judged as great by how many people do want to play it and do get to play it and walk off it saying it's a great course. So I think we shouldn't be so afraid of uh, opening up the gates a little bit. Oh, that's so fat. I hope you didn't get that on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this thing. <laughs> chest chest for, uh, for scale. Rob. You gotta borrow some sunscreen, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. What, what were you saying about why it's so important for have, to have sunscreen? Well, when you lose all of your hair at an early age, like me, uh, sometimes at the back of your hat, you get a little sunburn going through there. And, and unfortunately that happened too many times. All my coworkers started calling me sunrise because <laughs> it looks like a sunrise in the morning. So I need to borrow some sunscreen right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, does golf need saving? I don't think so, honestly. I mean, I'm traveling around. I mean, all these people that are crazy about golf. I'm throwing out on Instagram, like, hey, come golf with me, and like seven dudes show up, <laughs> right? So from my point of view, like golf's, golf's good, but it's changing. Matt Carr just called it the modern golfer. It has to more do more with like lifestyle, clothes, gear, music, all that. Like that that's all kind of intertwined. It's getting kind of younger and cooler in a way. And, uh, and I think that's awesome. And, and I played with uh, the dude named Nathan. He was talking about, you know, how much enjoyment he gets now out of, you know, the podcasts and the follows and the message boards, the Golfer's Journal. And there's just a lot of new ways to consume golf and that don't take that much time. Now, whether they're playing it as much, uh, just because of the time factor and how busy we are, I don't know. But um, I mean, that's why I love nine holers, love shorter courses, love these sort of new concept courses that people are doing. So no, I think golf's good, man. because you're wearing a mesh hat. Yeah, he's got the line all yeah, down the top. Yeah, you got the top. line right down so, the middle of your head. He's got the line in this. <laughs>
Yeah. Like there's, wearing, there's our sunrise that he was like talking you're about. Wearing like a thong with like a open U right by the ass crack. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't that what it looks like, like a girl's ass the other way around. There's Crossless like the, pants. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Thank you. It's it's unbelievable. <laughs> that's, that's good. That's good. Shit. <laughs> Shit.